Jiro here for Umber Games with a review of Divinity Original Sin Enhanced Edition, played on PlayStation 4. Original Sin is the third title from Larian Studios to bear the Divinity name, although it greatly differs in gameplay than the Divinities that have come before. So are you ready for this? Divinity Original Sin is an open world role playing game where all combat takes place in a turn based tactical RPG system. Now most tactical RPGs, at least those that come to us in the console gaming world, consist of selecting a location from a map and then engaging in the combat, not running around the world, gathering quests, and facing random encounters, much less doing so cooperatively. That's right, co-op tactical RPG. So on paper, Divinity Original Sin is quite a treat. You begin Divinity by creating two characters, a male and a female, and set their starting classes, which basically just determines starting stats. Any concept of class is strictly in your imagination because you give points to strength and two-handed weapons and you make a warrior. Do dexterity and bows and you can make an archer, or of course intelligence and one or more schools of magic and you have a mage. The ability to cross-skill a character is here, but considering the end of the game puts you around level 20, give or take, your options for proficiency aren't unlimited. Enemies don't respawn in this game, so there really isn't an opportunity to grind to get those extra attribute or skill points. In addition to your two party members, you can recruit from a handful of NPCs once you find them. You can equip, level up, and play these characters as if they were your own. Although, they will leave you if you happen to harm them a few times. I think you can get them back though, I mean, but we just reloaded. I mean, hypothetically, if we would hit them, we would have reloaded. <clears throat> For our party though, I played the female and concentrated on casting, including intelligence and points given to fire, wind, earth, and water magic classes. My partner Hercules started with a battle mage hybrid, then he kind of switched to leaning more onto two-handed weapons and used the witchcraft and fire schools of magic for buffs and some decent damage, and we mistakenly chose Medora, who may be one of the most obnoxious NPCs I've ever partied with, but he made her a full-on two-handed warrior damage dealer, and I chose a roguelike character with bow and ranger proficiencies. It actually turned out to be a really well-balanced party. While each player has to control one of the main characters, the other NPCs can be distributed however you see fit. So the story in Original Sin has you starting with the aforementioned male-female combo who have lost their memories as a whole, but belong to a sect called Source Hunters. Source being a, quote, dangerous type of magic. The characters are sent out to a town called Cecile, where a counselor was recently murdered and sorcery, with a U, was expected to be at play. Through conversation and environment inspection, the Source Hunters begin their journey to track down some of the most dangerous sorcerers, with a U, around, which lead them to the discovery of Bloodstones, or Star Stones, or Inert Stones. This is where things really began to fall apart for us. Upon retrieval of a Star Stone, our heroes were whisked away to an area called the End of Time, more casually referred to as the Homestead. We met an imp and a time weaver who said we were probably important people, we just didn't know it. Then we go to this town called Silver Glen, and there's ore there called Tenebrium, and miners are forced to harvest it from these caves. When human skin comes into contact with Tenebrium, they contract rot. Rot, as its name implies, is bad. They say the only way they've seen rot removed is through the use of a bloodstone. So some cult is slaughtering imps and putting their blood into shiny stones to heal people. It just, it makes it all sound so casual, like a, like a potion. Sometimes you'll walk into a place and a jewel will do this explosion thing and then you go to your homestead and another room is unlocked. Sometimes something will keep triggering movie events when you travel back to the homestead. And then in the final area of a game, a talking door won't let you through unless you've quote, ascended. So after obtaining 12 of these inner blood star stones, a video pops up explaining that these are pieces of the duo's memory and then that talking door will let you in. I mean, looking back, to gather these stones that seem to be random, I mean, there were some that were used as medicine, and some were just in a side quest area in a coffin or a dig spot that you had to have high character perception to perceive. I mean, this brings me to the first place where this game falls down. I mean, we're talking about a 70 hour old school computer type RPG that's co-op. When you or your friend talk to someone, they get a dialog box. But if you want to see that dialog box, you have to find the person they're speaking to and click a button to listen in. Now, this game has a lot of dialogue and a lot of dialogue choices. It has a ton of books and a ton of NPCs, which can make the thing very difficult to follow along. Maybe somebody mentioned collecting 12 star stones, which become bloodstones when they're bled on, which heal someone and then are drained to become inert, but they certainly didn't make it very obvious, especially for it being the main goal of the game. 
Now, I'm not one for having things spoon-fed to me in a game. I don't need a quest marker telling me every turn I need to take. I enjoy exploring. But in Divinity, your quest journal rarely tells you what to do, and more of what you did. I found a purse in the woods. It's pink. I wonder who it belongs to. I mean, our quest log was still so full by the time we finished the game because most of the time the lack of in-game direction made it so difficult. We somehow at one point even managed to skip a main quest point, freeing an important NPC, because we didn't realize we could. Until four or five hours later, not knowing how to proceed, we looked at a walkthrough and, and discovered how much we missed. Now, with all that said, and things we did figure out, Original Sin provided options and multiple quests for your choice and completion. You can choose loyalty, paper, rock, scissor your way through a conversation mechanic to avoid fights, and oftentimes just break down doors you can't find a key to. As mentioned, we did end up using a walkthrough from time to time, but this is Divinity Original Sin Enhanced Edition. The PC version came out like a year and a half ago, and there are quite a few differences between this and that especially toward the end of the game, and finding help when we were stuck was sometimes even more frustrating, especially because it feels like a solution to a puzzle or two, even when the internet writing made sense, was sometimes using a hack to proceed. Divinity has a fairly complex crafting system, requiring you have a character that maintains both blacksmithing and crafting skills. You can gather materials from boxes, crates, and enemy drops to make new weapons, food, potions, and arrows. You can combine water and flour to make dough, tomato and dough to make pizza dough, and then pop in an oven to make a pizza. Taking a knife to a branch will make arrow shafts, then a knife with various materials to make different kinds of arrowheads, which can then be combined with the shaft. I mean, we really didn't find too much of a need to craft. I mean, anything other than some health potions and some arrows, as the loot drops for weapons and the amount of stuff she could find or steal covered the most basic needs. Speaking of loot, Gear comes in various rarities from common white to green, then blue, purple, and eventually yellow legendary pieces. Each character can equip a helmet, a chest piece, belt, gloves, boots, two rings, an amulet, and a sarong. There's a skill called Lore Master that allows you to identify drops, revealing the various stats and bonuses. You can also cheat the Lore Master system a bit by saving pieces of equipment that increase that skill, and just equip them when you need to identify. Gear will have stat bonuses, or status effect protection, or infliction, or allow access to certain skills while they're equipped. Gear also has to be repaired, so having a character with blacksmithing ability is pretty important. So let's get down to the battle system. You can click L3 at any time to take a cursor and view the area around you. If you're fortunate enough to spot enemies ahead of time, you can prepare a buff or summon a pet before you engage. If you're really good, you and your co-op partner can both do so, without being seen. Now wherever you approach a battle, that's where you start turns are based on ability point or AP usage. Each character has a starting amount of AP based on some stats, they generate a certain amount of AP per turn based on some stats, and they have a max AP that can be held at one time, you guessed it, based on some stats. Each ability consumes a specific amount of AP, including attacking, which changes based on the level and the type of weapon, oh yeah, and some stats. Characters can move varying distances, depending on the weight of their armor they're carrying, and some stats. Okay, I'm just going to stop saying that now, just trust me when I say this game is heavily based on numbers, which is awesome. There's a cue at the top that generally is accurate when showing when a character's turn is approaching, but not very accurate in how much HP they have judging by their portrait. Sometimes in co-op, it seemed like this was like behind a little bit or just freaked out, but for the most part it was solid. So one of the coolest parts about this game is the way things and environment react to abilities. Let's take, for example, a barrel of oil. Hit it with fire, it explodes. Now, if you need an extra edge, you can just carry a barrel with you and strategically place it or throw it onto the battlefield and blow it up. I mean, sure, it's heavy, and the distance you can throw it is based on some stats. Once that barrel explodes, it will leave a patch of fire on the ground that hurts. Cast a rain spell, make that fire go away, and you're left with steam you can't see through. Run a tornado through that steam, make it dissipate. Is there any water left on the ground from the rain? Throw an ice spell on it to make it a slick surface and watch people, including teammates, fall on their butts. Or throw some lightning in it and make everybody that walks in it be stunned. One of the craziest things of all, though, involves the undead. The undead have poison in their veins, and when hit with piercing damage, they'll excrete it, poisoning anyone near the wound. Unfortunately, because their blood is poison, poison on the undead heals them. So for every piercing damage you do to one, it takes some damage, but also heal. Poison reacts greatly to fire though, so if a zombie is standing on fire and you make it bleed poison, you'll get additional fire damage on the target you hit with piercing. It did take us a while to figure out some of these mechanics, but it just adds a crazy amount of depth to each encounter. 
The problem while learning that is that the beginning of the game is very punishingly difficult. Not just because of the learning curve, but you really have very few abilities when you start, money is pretty scarce, and the only way to resurrect party members near the beginning is through the use of resurrection scrolls, which sure seemed expensive at first, and there isn't an unlimited supply. You pretty much go through the game in a constant struggle to stay ahead of the difficulty curve in gear and hit power, but it usually was in an alluring way that made our victories feel extremely rewarding, and fortunately characters earn experience with each kill whether they're alive or not. With your in-game level only being at about 20, you feel the difference throughout the game when you attempt an encounter with the level gap being greater than 1. So chances are if you're not following a walkthrough and able to complete all the side quests, you will get behind from time to time and have some crazy difficulty spikes due to those level differences. As mentioned, since enemies don't respawn, you either need to figure out some solid tactics for the encounter or try to go do something else first. We did have a few AI glitches in combat, sometimes with the pathing of our own characters when we tell them where to go, or line of sight the game told us we had, but didn't, which were kind of frustrating, but sometimes it actually kind of balanced out. There'd be times where the enemy AI couldn't figure out what it was supposed to do, it would just sit there for about 20 seconds and then give up its turn doing nothing. While those encounters did feel kind of dirty when we won them, other times it really helped and we just felt lucky getting the help on a nigh impossible match. There are tons of status effects in Divinity. Some were unclear exactly what they were doing, and it's pretty much always guaranteed they'll hit you with something you don't have an ability to counteract. You absolutely have to focus on inflicting status effects of your own, whether it's stunning with lightning, knocking down with warrior moves, or slowing or freezing with specific arrows. Now, pets are also helpful, and are available in several trees, a fire elemental for the pyromancy skill, spider for the geomancers, and undead skeletons for witchcraft, etc. And these summons will generally stay around for two to three turns before they disappear if they're not killed first. All abilities have a cooldown timer by turns that decreases the higher skill level you have in that skill. Buffs and debuffs also last for a number of turns and when outside of combat they'll kind of tick down instead. In combat your various status effects will show beside each character's portrait but a summon countdown is for some reason absent. It would definitely have been helpful to be able to see that. Now you can save at any point during combat, which does help sometimes when things go right, or if you didn't get a chance to save before an encounter. You can also flee from most fights as long as there's enough distance between you and the opponents, and it will take you to your last waypoint that you travel. Now all of that said, both good and bad, the sheer amount of freedom you have in figuring out how to win the day in combat is truly a marvel in game design. Overall Divinity is a beautiful game, from its environments to its particle effects. Character models aren't super detailed, but you spend most of the game zoomed out at a pretty far level. I think the music is also slightly undersold, especially because I spent the 70 hours of the game in constant chat with headphones on, and the game volume turned down, but there's some very well-written, appropriate tunes that add even more to the depth of this world they've created. And I do have to just add in, let's look at the obvious issue of doing turn-based combat for this long in a cooperative manner. Make sure that you don't play this game with that one person whose turn it is in Mario Party where they just need to hit the A button to hit that dice, if only they were paying attention. If you do, that's on you. I try to think about how many console games like this have that strategic tactical turn-based combat like they have, and a giant world to explore and quest in. Kinda wonder why it's not done more often. But then I stop and think about the only time I really had fun while playing Divinity Original Sin was like 90% during combat and 10% in skill and character building. I think that it's just because the questing and goals are so obtuse in the game though. I just never felt like we had a clear path or destination. Now I wonder if I'd played in single player if I would have paid a little more attention, but I didn't want to waste the opportunity of a co-op experience. And while I was definitely ready for the game to end around 40 hour mark, we did have a lot of fun. Divinity Original Sin Enhanced Edition is a turn-based strategy RPG, and rated as such ended up at a 68 out of 100 on my scale. This is Jiro from Umber Games. Thanks for watching.